Hello, I am Aenar Prime. I remake a One Piece Iceberg so you don't have to. We are now in tier 2, and ever since Cockpiece, it's a downward spiral from here on out. Soro vs Sanji If there's one constant in all pop culture media, there's always gonna be an argument which is better between two different franchises or elements in one singular franchise. Things like which Star Wars movie are good, what is the best Disney movie, or even a ranking tier list of Cartoon Network shows that someone probably made on YouTube. Who knows? And One Piece shares the same kind of discourse like anime versus manga, is it the best of the big three, and my least favorite, Roronora Soro versus Redacted Sanji. Second most would be Shanks versus Draco Miok, but there's at least a mystery element behind them. Soro and Sanji are both part of the main cast and have had more screen time and are considered the strongest members of the Straw Hats. When the Straw Hats fight an ensemble cast of antagonists, there's always a packing order of who fights who, and I can count five arcs where almost every Straw Hat gets a one-on-one -on -one conclusive fights. There are other arcs with 1v1 fights, but they have characters other than the Straw Hats fighting, so I don't technically count them. Soro always fights the second strongest, while Sanji always fights the third strongest. In fact, with his formula, the statement is in favor of Soro's stance. The Sanji stance argue that he once had a higher bounty than Soro. Bounties equal power, apparently. Check part 1 for that whole debate. As recently discovered, his body is also augmented like his siblings, and if given the chance, he could fight the second strongest. I have many gripes with all of this. The fact that we need to use 5 arcs out of like 30 something to justify Soro's superiority, and not just counting arcs where Sandy doesn't fight and or win. Also those second strongest being very hyperbolic statement. Although I agree that most of Soro's opponents are more serious, and Sanji's opponents are a ballerina and Dr. Eggman. Arlon Park and Aeneas Lobby did give Sanji more serious looking opponents, but no one really gives a shit about them. And honestly, I don't give a shit about this. Even Oda doesn't give a shit about this. I love all the Straw Hats. Soro and Sanji are my funny himbo boys, and a scene with them not fighting is my favorite scene of all time. If you really want to validate your favorite character with whom's the strong, go ahead, but I think that is undermining them. Either way, we can all agree that Soro x Sanji shippers are superior. Anyway, let's hope there isn't another discourse of argument in this hockey versus devil fruits. <laughs> Oh boy, look at that, another discourse. But unlike Mosshead vs Steve Buscemi, this is kinda interesting. As we all know, the Devil Fruits in One Piece is what gives the series its unique and appealing quirk. They come in three categories of elements, animals, and random Jeez. bullshit. And there are like hundred of them, with the highest of highs and the one that turns you into a jacket. Now let's talk about the other power set, Haki. Haki, sometimes called Mantra or Ryo, is the very limited and very basic power set of willpower that also comes in three categories of spider sense, enhanced strength, and mind cross. And ever since the beginning of the time skip, Haki has taken over as the set pieces of fight scenes in the series. And ever since I discovered that, I was kinda taken aback, but at the same time, the post time skip arcs introduced like 10 times more devil fruits, so it balances out. I understand and accept the usage of Haki in the story, but I cannot accept it overtaking devil fruits. Which it hasn't done, so I guess Kaido ate his own word when he drowned in magma. X for Straw Hat. Continuing the topic of One Piece internet discussion, Straw Hats have many, like Soro vs Sanji, which we went over, which is your favorite Straw Hat, I'm not gonna go over that right now, and what other non-Straw Hat will become the next Straw Hat. And as high and mighty I come off in my videos, like I'm above petty arguments, I also was taken into these hypotheticals. Hyper, hyper. The criteria for X for Straw Hats varies depending on fan perspective. Luffy asking randos to join the crew, their personalities and abilities that fit the crew's dynamic, and having just as much screen time as the Straw Hats themselves. Two of the biggest recent candidates were the rabbit mink girl Carrot and good boy Yamabro. During the bridging arcs between So and Whole Cake Island, Carrot kinda just snuck on board the ship and became an important ally for the latter arc. And quite honestly, I was kinda on board with her becoming the next member. She has a symbol yet eye-catching design, a charming personality, a gimmick that at first kinda is similar to Nami's but becomes more of its own thing, the cutest dynamic with Chopper, and was initially given an important role by Pedro to help the Straw Hats in the future. But sadly, as the Wano arc 
began, Garrett became more of a background character, and her spotlight was stolen by Garfield over there. I mean, I love Garfield, I love Song Won Cho. Suge win? What is wrong with you? But that was kinda lame. Bada bing, bada boom, Garrett is now the leader of the furries, cause she needs to do something that is not joining the Straw Hats. Another thing that overshadowed Carrot for Straw Hat was the introduction of Yamato, who is probably the first non-Straw Hat character who has audibly proclaimed his desire to join the Straw Hat. Maybe the second one, because there's this anime scene in So where it's heavily implied that Carrot was gonna ask Luffy to join the crew, and with how Wano abruptly ended, which is kinda ironic considering how long Wano was, Yamato decided to stay on Wano for reasons, but has claimed he will one day join them in the future. I guess that tattoo isn't jumping the gun. There are countless of other candidates, like Tama, who also said she wanted to join them in the future. Caesar Clown, because comedy. This random zombie tree and unicorn. Gaimon, Crocus, Kinemon's legs, and other fan favorite characters like Bon Clay, who has had the greatest moments in the series assisting Luffy and the gang. And honestly, giving Bon Chen a win like that is what we all truly desire. But on a more realistic look at all of this, the reason we can't have all these candidates would kinda ruin the focus on key characters who are already in the Straw Hats. And sure, some of these we have discussed could fit, but that could be a monkey's paw waste more than anything. With the Straw Hat being now around 10 members, or 12 if you count Vivi and Karu, there are some who get more focus than others to most people's grimances. But the speculation is always fun. Now who would I want to join? Uh, let's ask the wheel. Arthur's Library of Ohara Archer's Library of Ohara began his career as a blocker with his own website where he would write breakdown reviews of the latest chapter and now also does video versions of them on his YouTube channel. He's been writing these breakdowns ever since 2015 and continues to this very day with not just regular chapters, but he also translated the Vivri card data book which will be its own segment. There's also translating the latest SBS at the time, weird parody chapters, a whole fan manga about what happened at the Levely before we actually learn what happened at the Levely, again, it's his own segment, and his insane three hour theory on what the One Piece is. But the most important thing about Archer is that One Piece has changed his life so much for the better. Having been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and a very hard childhood, he goes into more detail in his video right here so check it out. I'm a big fan of Arthur's videos and blogs. I hope for the best for him in the future and if he's watching this I can assure you there's much better content out there than this. The Worst Generation during the Sabaori Archipelago arc, Oda wanted to make the arc more interesting due to not much happening early on and lacking interesting characters. Thus, he came up with 9 new characters out of the blue. Those were Jewelry Bonnie, Battle Hawkins, Cat Bone Beige, Uros, DS Drake, Scratchman Apu, Trafalgar Law, Eustace Kit, and Killer. Together with Luffy and Sorrow, they made up the group name 11 Supernovas. Only after the time skip, their name changed into the Worst Generation when they added Blackbeard into the mix, cause he just has to be in every group. The Worst Generation as a concept is something that took a while to actually become relevant in the story. The idea of Oda making up 9 new characters in such a short amount of time with a weekly schedule is highly praiseworthy, but I think most people forget that they didn't do much of anything in their initial appearance apart from being introduced with their bounty and flexing with their arguably coolest fucked devil fruits, except Roche. And I have this theory that their pre-time skip design might have been one of their prototype concept designs. Like there are minor changes like Cabone getting a goatee, but then there is the extreme like DS Drake removing his bicorn to reveal his... There's something about Mary hairstyle. But that's just a theory. Okay! Oh, oh. Oh shit. Now these characters have had their spotlight for the better, wars, or as this is still being written, still have their time to shine. Except the Roche. Boss Luffy. Now that the Wano arc has come to a conclusion in the anime and manga, let's talk about the time One Piece was set in pseudo-Japan before Wano existed. Sure, it was not canon and was set in a different universe, but still, I think it's neat. The Boss Luffy special depicted the cast of One Piece living in Gurenjipangu, where Luffy and Usab are police duo, Sanji and Nami run a restaurant, Chopper is the town's doctor, Zoro is a traveling monk who also is a swordsman, and Robin is just wiping 
there, with the last two episodes introducing Frankie and Brooke later on. For a while, it was only a single special episode, but later on got five episode sequels that included more One Piece characters, with one of them being Panda Man, which might be the only time he got an actual important role in, in the entirety of One Piece. Check out this episode if you haven't seen them, they're kind of fun. Laughter Styles You know what? Anime characters are weird as fuck. They have quirky personality traits that sometimes are over-exaggerated of real life things. Are you introverted? Better make you cute. Do you have a family complex? Better make it sexual. You are a serial killer? Better give you a fetish. I kid, but not really. The most interesting way to make quirky anime characters is to make their laughs the most abnormal thing I've ever heard. I'm not gonna go through them all cause they are too many, but I'll say this for sure. Gekko Mori Hawkback and Brook, best lefters in the series. And they are all from Thriller Park, an arc that may have its drawbacks, but still has the lols. Literally and figuratively. figuratively. So just look up all the laughs, tell me in the comment which one is your favorite, or just laugh in the comments in your own laughter style. The only other anime I can think of that actually lists their own laughter styles is Kiniko Man. Did you know there's an Icelandic rap in Kiniko Man? His name is The Constellation. This has nothing to do with anything, I just wanted to tell you that to feel special. Eye Catches if you don't know what an eye catch is, I'm gonna guess you're a child who decided to watch this video out of curiosity, or you know what they are, but never thought about the actual names of these things. In short, they are musical jingles that appear in the middle of episodes so they can cut to commercial breaks that features either logos of the show, still artwork, or short animation. Famous ones include the Dragon Ball C one with Goku and Gohan, and the Who's That Pokemon segment from Pokemon. And with how long One Piece has been going on, there have been various eye catches for the anime. They almost have the same visual representation with showing off the straw hats and their personal jingles. The first one ran for 206 episodes with a static image of the Go and Mary and made up wanted posters for the first 9 members of the crew. That's right, Vivi and Karu count. Look at this tiny Karu. Then it was changed in episode 207 when the aspect ratio went from 4-3 to 16-9 with more animation that perfectly tells you everything about the Straw Hats. Luffy being curious, Nami being stingy, and Brook's appearance juxtaposed to his personality. Those ran from episode 207 to 516 throughout all the pre-time skip. Then the third set that ran from episode 517 to 746 were probably the worst ones. Funny, since the anime at that time was also considered its worst era. No personal jingles and the second half is just the One Piece logo. Just the Straw Hats grabbing their personal belongings of a table before going somewhere without seeing their faces. The fourth set was welcoming Pace with a few caveats. We get the bounty posters again, only this time they are the actual posters from that time and showing off each of Straw Hats place of origins and not only that, two special ones of Law because he has been around for a while and Bartolomeo who doesn't get his own jingle, but a reused jingle from the Chopper Man episode. Why did Bartolomeo get an eye patch? I don't fucking know. Then Wano came along and got four set of eye catches. The first one was kind of a disappointment with a lot of promise since it was Wano style straw hat with her jingles played in an Enka style but only play Luffy and Soros themes alone. There was also a special run of eye catches that features all the 9 straw hats drawn in an Edo-like style for the Great Battle of Shibuya Lottery, and those look like fire. During the Odin flashback, we got Luffy and Roger looking excited with an artwork of their adventures. And after that, we got the Onikashima eye catchers with the straw hats along with Law, Kid, and Yamado in Hanafuda cards, where we finally got a Jinbei eye catch. These eye catches are only there for aesthetics, but I feel like they tell the story of One Piece just as well, especially the Odin variations. And I can't wait to see what they do in the future. Mistranslations. Like every manga back in the day, they did not have their official release outside of Japan, so fans across the internet had to translate the manga themselves online. And if you think they did a good job, 
well, uh, whoops, Google Translate is being silly. One Piece for a while and even today is known for some oddities and scandalations. Two of the most well-known entities were the names of two locations, being Laftail and Levely, or as we used to call them back in the good old days, Raftel and Reverie, although the latter one is still used from time to time in actual English localized translations. While the former had its re real name revealed in One Piece Stampede, the most overhyped One Piece movie I can think of. The funniest misspelled names are so many, but there are three noteworthy. Elbaf, the island of giant, which has just clicked into people's mind around Whole Cake Island arc, that is just fable spelled backwards, so these names make no sense. While the names of famous warlords Bartholomew Kuma and Don Quixote do Flamingo were named, and keep in mind this was their first appearance, Biro Somi Beer and Tanjia. Tanjia. Tanjia do Lofu. What the fuck? What the fuck? Tanchiala tan Tanchia do Lofu Lamingo. Just the perfect names of these perfect chats. Speaking of chats, there's also Katakuri, or as he used to be called in some versions, Dogtooth. And if you think this is a random name, well, it's not. This is a layered pun made by Scanlators. Dogtooth is a real life flower which is used to produce potato stars or Katakuriko. If only Japan had a humor for these kind of things. Hiatuses. A lot of fans tend to view Oda like a god of shonen literature, a goda, if you will. But I need to emphasize this statement, and this might be a hot take, but Eichiro Oda is just a mortal human being like all of us. And with how much the mangaka lifestyle can destroy one's health, reputation, and life, sometimes they should not overwork themselves and take some goddamn breaks once in a while. And One Piece is the third shonen jump manga I can think about that takes the most hiatuses. Others being D. Greyman and Hunter x Hunter. And I'm gonna guess all of them are are about health reasons. The latter one with Hunter x Hunter author Yoshihiro Togashi being one of the most devastating cases I know of. The only thing I know about D. Grayman is that the manga has gone from four different jump magazines. One Piece being one of the best selling mangas out there, it's very noteworthy cause some jackass is not posting spoilers everywhere and people cry that they aren't eating tonight. Like Jesus people, the man had to get his tonsils removed, eye surgery, and, you know, spend time with his fucking family. Let's not push Mangaka so hard online or in real life. One pace, man. The anime is so long. If only I could watch it with better pacing and manga accuracy. <gasps> is this the fan project One Pace? Why? Yes, it is. One Piece started in 2013 by a person known as Akamisu, who has expanded his team of editors, graphic designers, and translators to 50 members. Their big goal as One Piece fans is to make the One Piece anime into a shorter and more digestible show for fans or newcomers to catch up with the story faster, which should be praised because they have to watch all of the original anime so they can cut out filler, shorten scenes that drag out, and edit clips to make them look like the manga. This is one of One Piece's greatest strengths and also its greatest weakness. Though I can agree that the pace in One Piece can be terrible from time to time, the way they create an accurate cut of the anime to the manga is questionable. The media of manga and anime may be close, but it's not 50-50. There are countless scenes that are manga exclusive, so the anime version of those specific scenes must be used. As for removing filler, well, I am the first to say that One Piece filler arcs are probably the shortest fillers I can think of. They are not a must-watch, except the scene where Nami kills a guy named Eric, the G8 arc, and the Brook episode where he tries to fit in with the Straw Hats. But there are anime-only scenes in canon arcs that can be argued to add more to the story and work better for the anime and to cut some of those scenes may make the pacing feel a little off. The edits are an interesting case. When they are not just shortening scenes so that they flow better, they also use fan art, actual black and white manga panels, and clips from reanimated TV specials for a more quality look. Despite most of the time, 90% of the show has not gotten the episode off treatment. 
Seven for the Battle of Wars. The entirety of Luffy's backstory is just taken straight out of the episode of East Blue segment. And then BAM! Next episode is the first episode of the old late 90s, early 2000s anime. Then there's a reason for all of these weird inconsistencies. Because this project started in 2013, the edits that featured fan arts and manga panels are the earliest edits within Fishman Island and Punk Hazard. But over the years, they have improved with this project and now it looks less amateurish. Like, remember that whole removing filler? Well, I just started watching this as I'm writing and recording. And during Logetown, some fillers are featured in this project, like Luffy going to the Gold Roger bar and Usopp meaning Daddy the Father. Also, they still haven't edited all the episode as I'm writing this. But hey, if it sounds good to you and you want to get into One Piece with lesser fillers, then check it out or read the manga. Episode of Series we have talked about how fans make a condensed version of our favorite pirate stories, but let's talk about when Toei does it. The episode of series is a name of movies and TV specials that ran from 2007 to 2018, were a bridged version of famous story arcs that were made into hour and a half long movies. The result varied from time to time, so I'll just do a rapid fire review of them all. One Piece, episode of Arabasta. I think the only thing people remember about this one is Nami has humongous homonga ganga la honga la gangas 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 bungalas gangas. Also, the crocodile fight was neat, but overall, the movie is more of a best of compilation rather than a cohesive movie. One Piece, episode of Chopper Plus. Honestly, this one is pretty decent. This AU movie that happens to include Robin and Frankie is something that the other movies should have done more. Maybe less of Wapol's non-canon brother Mushuru. This is the cooler of One Piece movies and you can't do anything about it. Sadly, it doesn't include characters like Vivi, Karu, and the biggest loss of them all, Chesmarimo. One Piece Nami. Without a doubt, one of the best. With all the things they skip like that stupid Luffy in the water seeing and pudding pudding, it almost feels like the perfect One Piece special based on one of the best arcs in the series. One Piece episode of Luffy Hosokete. This one doesn't technically count since there are like two flashbacks of Shanks and the most manga accurate Alavita scene that lasts around 5 minutes each in this hour and a half minute special that has nothing to do with Luffy overall. It's a mid special with his Goofus as an antagonist. It's also the first depiction of Kobe being cool so that's something. One Piece. My favorite part of this entire special is Usopp telling Brooke about the Go and Mary while they ride the Mini Mary. With that out of the way, this special looks ugly. Everyone looks like they're covered in oil and fight scenes are awkward to look at. Also, they changed the song during the Mary funeral, which if you are a big fan of Triplane, this might be the worst one yet. This special came out when Dressrosa was still airing, and the manga was only a month from concluding the set arc. We get to see Dressrosa scenes reanimated, even though it hasn't been a year in between the show and this special. Also, Sabo flashbacks, if you care about Sabo, I really don't. He, he got boring real fast. Um, the animation is... Uh, pretty to look at compared to the show at the time. Also, the special doesn't end per se. It's the ultimate best of compilation. The worst kind of movie. One Piece, episode of East Blue. This is the first animated appearance of Mornin. This is also the third time we adapt the first chapter. Other problems include Storo segment is kind of bad in terms of transition, Usopp and Sanji are alright, and Nami got the short end of the stick since her segment was cut short. To was like, eh, we already made one, so just make it worse. One Piece, episode of Sorajima. This is the worst one for all all the reasons. I think this is what people who don't like Skybia think it's like. Boring, uneventful, and overall soulless. The special begins at Jaya and we cut out a few things that are not that important like Bellamy and Blackbeard. He appears in the end credit but it's the ace fight for some reason. We get a whole slideshow for a bunch of fight scenes we skip in this reanimated special. The Nolan backstory isn't really reanimated so what was the point? It's terrible. Don't watch it. Watch the Funimation outtakes instead. It's better than the entire special. Oh, it's one of my favorite One Piece villains. Oh Jesus, I forgot your voice. Out of all the eight movies and specials, only two of them are watchable. But hey, if it looks good to you, then check it out. Or read the manga.
Monsters. Out of all of the short mangas that Oda wrote before One Piece, Monster is his most popular one-shot of them all. It tells the tale of Ryuma, a wandering samurai who saves a town from a dragon, and yeah, that's it. Most of Oda's one-shot gets some to little references in his main series. But Monster is an exception because the one-shot is canon to One Piece. As Ryuma appears as a zombie in Thriller Bark, whom Soro directly fought, defeated, and inherited his sword, Chusi, until they reached Swano where he got Kosugi Odin's sword Emma in exchange to give back Sushi since it was their national treasure. Too bad they didn't know Sora was related to Ryoma because later on in an SPS it was confirmed that Ryoma's family name is Shimotsuki, which features many noteworthy members such as Yasuye, Kosaburo the swordsmith who made both Emma and the Wano Ichimonji, who's also the father of Koshiro, who's the father of Kuina, who lived live in the Shimotsuki village in East Blue. Also, Ushimaru had a sister named Furiko who married a man named Ronor's Pinsaro, who had a son named Arashi who married a girl named Terra who gave birth to their son Ronor Soro. Very simple. Just recently, Monster got an adaptation by the up-and-coming studio ENH production and was directed by Shung Hu Park who has worked on many animes. And it looked hella fine. Pink Saki What's up guys, Anthony Prime Tano here. This is the titular pirate song famously sung by the musician of the Straw Hats, Brook. It's one of the most popular original songs in One Piece with a few versions such as Brook Solo, Straw Hat version, Roger version, and the Uta version. Its most famous use was during the conclusion of Brook's backstory that might be the most heart-wrenching Straw Hat backstory. There's also been the growing fan theory that the lyrics of the songs are actually a clue to what the One Piece is. I told my sister uh, this theory and she responded with yo ho 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 yo ho 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 Others have taken it meaning very literally that the One Piece treasure is a bottle of sake which Okay, would you all be disappointed if the treasure at the end of the series was a bottle of Heineken? I would, because I don't drink. But I interpreted Binksake as a quintessential song that represents the whole series. It is a pirate song that's both joyous and sad, cause just like in Thriller Bark, the song is used for Brook backstory, juxtaposed with being played after the Thriller Bark story ends, which leads to Brook joining the crew at the end of the song. A story with many tragedies, but comes with a happy ending. I give this song a strong 9. Silhouettes Oda once stated in an interview that drawing silhouettes is one of the reasons his story continues to expand. This practice is based on the fact that it creates hype for what's to come. Personally speaking, seeing these silhouettes back in the day was pretty hype. But the most interesting aspect of these silhouettes is their initial design versus their final designs. The biggest one people like to point out is that the four emperors, with Shanks and Whitebeard being fairly accurate since we already seen them, but Kaido and Big Mom are very far away from what we got. But the one people tend to forget is the original Shichibukai, where they are just seven dudes with swords, and thank god we didn't go with that. Let's hope these holy knights will be as weird. Also let's not forget Emu, the other final antagonist of One Piece, who may just be a shadow creature based on their powers. Can't wait to see fans be disappointed when they see Emo's real design if it exists. There it is! <sighs> Crocodile is Luffy's mom. Out of all the fan theories, Crocodile is Luffy's mom is one of the longest lasting theories, which is also one of the few theories I feel like putting on this tier list. In fact, I think it's the very first one I heard about when I started One Piece. The following theory is based on events that came to light during Impel Down, where Crocodile got blackmailed by Ivankov to help Luffy and the Impel Down gang to escape because Ivankov threatened Crocodile with his secret, something that only Ivankov could only give to him. Based on the idea of Ivankov's devil fruit, the hormone Hormon fruit that can change people's biological gender, it is believed that Crocodile is a trans male. And with how the fandom can be very obsessed with theories based on Straw Hat's blood families, Crocodile being Luffy's mom came to be because Luffy has a mom maybe, Crocodile was born female maybe, ergo Crocodile is Luffy's mom maybe. Now. My thoughts on theories overall are quite meh, and this is no exception. Even with this sketch of Crocodile as a woman, it's just a what if. 
Although... Condoriana. During the G8 arc, a filler arc that's regarded as the best filler arc, and even by some considered better than the canon arc that came after it, and sometimes even better than the one that came before, our Straw Hat crew accidentally landed in the marine base of G8. Out of all the unique and fun characters we meet in said arc, such as Vice Admiral Jonathan, his wife Jessica, and Drake, there's one character that stands out, Commander Shepard. As soon as he's introduced to the Ark, Robin knocks him out, takes his identity, and gets him thrown in jail where both Usopp and Zoro are being held. I'm paraphrasing a lot, you should probably watch the anime to find out why they're in jail. Usopp, knowing Robin is pretending to be him, decides to trick the guards by calling Shepard his fellow crewmate, Condoriano. 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 Which leads to a very funny running gag with Shepard accidentally helping the Straw Hats throughout the arc. While most of the time filler characters are almost forgotten with the exception of being brought up as... being forgotten. And let's be honest here, Shepard isn't gonna make a reappearance anytime soon. However, in the One Piece meme culture, the legend of Khan D. Oriano lives on with the other meme legends like Buggy D. Clown, Gangster Gastino, and everybody's favorite, Down D. Stairs. I haven't actually seen this arc, I'm just reading from a script because I'm being held against my will. Please send help. The only reason I'm even aware of this character's existence in the first place is because there's a joke character in anime campaign named after him, which is some eldritch knowledge that Einar only has because of me. Let's go. Cover Stories The beginning of every chapter features a cover of various content. Most of the time it's straw hats or other characters hanging out with an animal or a color spread with all the straw hats doing some activity. But the third variations are the cover stories. A short story that most of the time tells stories about what's happening somewhere else in the story. Most of the time featuring villains having a redemption arc of some sort or showing how they come back into the story. There are now over 25 of them and it sucks that most of them get ignored by the anime with only three of them getting a full animated episodes, or six, but I don't count PowerPoint presentations. People don't know this, but a majority of them actually have impacts on the overall story. Some of them surprise you with how much impact it has, some have yet to have any relevance yet, or some were just supposed to be self-contained, cause I don't think Gedatsu Hot Spring Adventure is gonna be that significant. Now I said only six have appeared in the anime, but there is one cover story that gets a weird adaptation, being Django Stance Paradise that was renamed into Django Stance Carnival, and the second half was just a music video for Ready by Folder 5. Sadly, it did not feature Full Body, Hina, or the Tulip Pirates. There are two cover stories that I have categorized as unsolved mysteries, being Enel's Great Space Operations and CB9's Independent Report. Both are just as compelling, both filled with mystery and suspense about what it's gonna do in the future, and you know, just featuring two of the most popular villains in this story. While Rob, Lucci, and friends have returned to the story, the how and why has not been answered, and Enel is still on the moon with his mustache robot. And if I had to choose which one of these cover stories I want to know the conclusion of, I'd pick the more realistic answer because I want to know what is going on in Rob Luigi's stupid feline head. Naruto Tribute Naruto is a manga by Masashi Kishimoto that ran from 1999 to 2014 with highs and lows in its quality. Fun fact, when I started getting into anime, I started with Bleach out of all the big three, then it led me to watch One Piece, and not because I was interested but more of a completionist way, I watched Naruto so my feelings are very complicated towards the series. With that in mind, I would say that despite the very long drawn out last arc, the ending was pretty neat and Kishimoto decided to pay tribute to one of his greatest rivals in the manga industry, Medaka Box. Nah, it's obviously One Piece, this is not the Medaka Box iceberg. Anyway, in the final page of the last chapter of Naruto, his son Bolt painted the Straw Hat Jolly Roger on the Hokage Mountain. This was both a very wholesome tribute and a weird effect on Bolt that made him a One Piece fan. That was very much proven right in Boruto SD. Yeah, remember the SD series? where Boruto blatantly makes a One Piece reference. I was gonna make Boruto as a One Piece fan its own segment on the iceberg, but I don't want to talk about Boruto because he gives me a headache. Living Devil Fruits and Swords 
I already explained devil fruits, so let's talk about the Soan type for a while. The Soan devil fruits are the most relevant in the story for it even has its own set of subcategories from standard, ancient, mythical, and artificial smile fruits. Soan is also the only devil fruit that has both been consumed by humans, animals, and even non-living objects. In recent chapters, Dr. Vekapong theorized that devil fruits both came into being from people's desire taking physical forms and that they are some sometimes have mind on their own. That does actually make sense, since we have seen a cannon eating a dog fruit, a sword eating an elephant fruit, and a teapot eating a raccoon dog food. But there have also been some occasions that normal objects have not eaten the devil fruit, have some will of their own. And I'm not just talking about the funny SBS drawings of Sorrow swords, earrings, and belly band, and other characters' weapons and side boobs. I mean, remember Enma, the sword that literally tried to drain Sorrow's stamina throughout his fight with stupid sexy king? If that does not prove that swords are sentient in some capacity, then I don't know what does. <clears throat> Jamie Lee Curtis Born in 1958, Jamie Lee Curtis started her acting at the age of 19 and has since started in many movies like Prom Night, Terror Train, and her breakout role as Laurie Strode in John Carpenter's Halloween. She's probably the only actress I can think of that has played a lesbian with hot dogs for fingers and still wins 5 awards for Best Actress. The segment here is a reference to the fact that she's a One Piece fan and has been featured in many fan casting articles playing Dr. Kuera in the live action Netflix show. In fact, this has been such a big fan casting that has even reached her attention. I wonder what she has to say about that. My question is that if you were to become anyone from any TV show, who would you be? I'd be Nico Robin from One Piece. Okay, I'm hyped. Uta and Otto. Uta is the very first female movie antagonist in the One Piece movies. Her starring role in the film Red, which has reached 20.33 billion yen in box office and is probably my favorite One Piece movie by far. Thanks for nothing, Stampede. You sure was a pandering fan service disguised as a movie. Film Red is also a musical that features many original songs which Uta sings, and they are just gold, and while she is voiced by Kaori Nasuka, best known for Wheelchair Baby from Code Geass, her singing is provided by the J-pop singer known only as Aro, making her debut with her song Uesa, and although I don't know anything about what it is or isn't the most popular in J-pop. All I know, she has 6 million subs on YouTube and her song reached 300 million views so I guess she is popular for that much. Also, I've been listening to her music for a while and loving it. Other fun facts about Uda include her short VTuber show called Uda Diary that were released before the movie and auto covers of Pink Sake which sounds great. One Piece The Movie the first theatrical One Piece movie called One Piece the Movie, evoking similar naming practice as Pokemon the first movie, was a movie that exists. I mean, it looks nice, but the characters are one note, the story is okay, and the fights are at best good looking, but nothing we haven't seen before. There is a belief that the early One Piece movie shared a similar curse to odd number movies are bad, a la the likes of Star Trek and um... Yeah, this movie, Chopper's Kingdom of Strange Animals and the Hearst Holy Swords are either considered very boring or very bad. Giant Mechanical Soldier of Karakuri Castle might be an odd numbered movie, but I liked it and not for the obvious reasons. The first movie is very mid to be honest, but it has two aspects of interest to it. First one is the main antagonist El Dorago. Is it because he's a well written, cool and badass villain? No, he is interesting because of his design and devil fruit powers of firing my laser that has been reused for a member of the Red Hair Pirates, Howling Gap, where it's heavily implied that in One Piece film Red, he can also do the same thing. The second case is the ending. <laughs> Spoilers. The premise of the film is the straw hat looking for the treasure of Unan, the great gold pirate who acquired the third of the world's gold. Once Luffy blasts El Dorago off to the hemisphere, the straw hats along with Ganso, a Odin chef and a childhood friend of Wunan and his grandson Tobito don't find the treasure in the end. But a message from Wunan where he laments even if he had all the treasure in the world that didn't make him feel fulfilled or happy, only sadness and loneliness. Therefore he returned it all and then died in isolation. 
This is quite the bittersweet ending to a movie that was mostly action and comedy. Some have even speculated that this movie predicts how the actual series is gonna end. Not like beat by beat, but more of the message. And with what we have learned in recent chapters, it feels like what the One Piece actually is is gonna be an inverse of what the Wunan treasure is. Who knows, can you take non-canon material to predict what happens in the future? I mean, maybe. Also, Wunan's design was reused for a video game character, but nobody cares. Treasure Cruise one Piece Treasure Cruise is an ongoing RPG mobile game that features artwork that you see all the time used by YouTubers. The style is very evergreen in nature, and in comparison to Oda's actual drawings, you can tell it's been streamlined in comparison. I never played this game, and I don't intend to. Also, Frieza shows up one time, because we can never escape Dragon Ball. Cross Epoch the very first One Piece Dragon Ball crossover that almost gets forgotten. Cause Loki, Cross Epoch is good shit. It tells a tale of a world created by a wish that Mr. Satan made on the Dragon Balls to become the king of the world, and it features a new version of the Straw Hats and Sea Fighters, either as friends or co-workers of some sort. The pairings that the manga come up with are perfect. Luffy and Goku being friends, with Luffy riding the Nimbus, Chopper also wrote the Nimbus in a special eye catch, Bulma and Nami being thieving duo a la the likes of Thelma and Louise, Sanji and Roshi as pigs, and the best duo of them all, Bucky and Pilaf being the leaders of the Pilapaki Villain Union, also featuring the Vegeta Sky Pirates, which is all kinds of awesome. In the end, everyone comes together for a party with Shenron holding a teacup. I want this to be remembered more than Toriko Special, cause that one just hurts. And that's it for Tier 2. Tune in next time when I feel like making Tier 3. Yep, 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 for-